Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is my task uh, today to talk to you about your jurisdiction in provisional measures cases. I am very happy to not have to weigh your spirit down with convoluted explanations nor extend our debate by repetitions, rehearsals and reminders full of agreeable veneration. My presentation will be brief. Why? Well, because your jurisdiction is easy to demonstrate and all the more so given the prima facie blueprint to which it is subjected. Furthermore, this stage, this preliminary stage, requires clear and linear responses which are bright, brief and incisive. So we can attempt to look at this with a in a calm spirit. The court has asserted on numerous occasions that the court need not satisfy itself in a definitive measure that it has jurisdiction as regards the merits of the case. It is sufficient for the court to conclude if the provisions relied on by the applicant appear prima facie to afford a basis on which its jurisdiction could be founded. Now, the basis for jurisdiction adduced by Armenia is the compromissory clause contained in Article 22 of the 1965 Third Convention. Both of the parties acceded to the Convention without reservation. The jurisdictional conditions thus of Article 22 are met. Let's have a look at that more closely. A dispute with respect to the application of the Convention? Well, of course. Correspondence between the parties in the Court's possession both attests and confirms it. Armenia alleged by its letter of 11 November 2020 that Azerbaijan had breached and continued to breach different obligations of the Convention. In its reply of 8 December 2020, Azerbaijan disputed being responsible for such breaches. The respective letters of the parties can be found in the annexes of Armenia's application and their exchange unequivocally demonstrates the existence of the dispute. Failed negotiations? Well, assuredly, your court has felt that a, negoti a negotiation precondition was satisfied when the party's basic positions had not subsequently evolved after several exchanges of diplomatic correspondence and or meetings. Now, in the instant case, the parties have had 40 exchanges of correspondence. They met up eight times and the parties have exchanged their views in a number of ways, but no agreement came about. Azerbaijan's positions on Armenia's claims have not varied, they remained negative. And the position of Armenia hasn't changed during these lengthy exchanges. In its letter of 11 November 2020, then in the standpoint it expressed on 31 May 2021 relative to the subject matter of negotiations, and once again in the meetings of 15 through 16 July 2021, and no less in the meetings of 14 through 15 September 2021, 
Armenia has asserted and argued one thing and one thing alone. What? Well, that Azerbaijan has breached and continues to breach Articles 2 to 7 of the 1965 Convention. Now, what has Azerbaijan done? Well, they have consistently and constantly denied these breaches. It's letter of 8 December 2020, and then Azerbaijan's replies during the negations 30, 31 August 2021, and the allegations, allegations in a number of its letters bear eloquent witness to this. Subsequently, the party's positions have not evolved. Do we need further proof? Well, if we do, here it is. Armenia laid claim to certain remedies with respect to violations of the 1965 Convention. Azerbaijan then rejected them wholesale during the meetings of 30 through 31st of August. Azerbaijan preferred to formulate a slew of counter-proposals. And at the same time, Azerbaijan defended itself from having committed acts contrary to the Convention. That was the point of the without prejudice clause in its correspondence. How could then these negotiations have succeeded? How do you negotiate with the perspective of a favourable result when the other side obstinately refuses to admit any breach of the Convention whatsoever? And what should we say about the time frame of these counter-proposals? They didn't only concern the future, but refused all responsibilities for past wrongs. I believe that here the non posumus and the non volumus of the venerable Mavromatis precedent could be usefully applied. Armenia cannot be forced to negotiate about something else, an aliud. Armenia has the right to stick to the Convention of 1965. And in this respect, the sound barrier could not be broken. In summary, it's beyond dispute that the positions of the parties haven't changed on these main points since the first exchanges at the end of 2020. Let us now come to those procedures especially provided for by the Convention. Now, following your Ukraine versus Russia precedent, prior procedural, procedural conditions of Article 22 are alternative. As such, the fact that the third committee was not being seized by Armenia is no barrier to your jurisdiction. Finally, May Armenia object to these racial discrimination measures? Well, I can see no obstacle to that. The applicant relies on its rights under the Convention and is not acting in diplomatic protection. So the condition of exhaustion of local remedies therefore does not apply. And the fact that the people involved are of Armenian, Armenian ethnic origin establishes a direct interest of the applicant. But in any event, this isn't dispositive because Armenia is also entitled to complain of the treatment meted out to these persons because the Convention opens access to the court erga omnes partes. Our current dispute is no different in this respect than in the Belgium versus Senegal case of 2012 relative to the 1984 Torture Convention. Thus, as you will have noted in reading Armenia's application, Armenia considers itself 
entitled to adduce the responsibility of Azerbaijan under the Convention, both as an injured state and as a non-injured state, within the meaning of Articles 42 and 48 of the 2001 Articles of the International Law Commission on International Responsibility of States. Let me underscore that Armenia is complaining of measures taken against persons of Armenian ethnic or national origin. And Armenia is not relying on these persons' formal nationality. Thus, we are not in the same factual framework as was the case Qatar versus United Arab Emirates of 2021. My conclusion is that the court has jurisdiction to entertain the Armenian application, and even more so, does the court have prima facie jurisdiction to entertain a request for provisional measures. To sum up, the legal basis on which Armenia seized you is beyond reproach and its action is wholly admissible. In peroration, let me underscore the fact that the court should not let itself be impressed by the serpentine arguments that our opponents may perchance raise in order to attempt to muddy the tranquil waters of provisional measures. Provisional measures proceedings should not be bogged down. They have to keep their autonomy in order to be able to fill their function, which is to protect, to, subje to subject this procedure to quibbles and nuances would be tantamount to adulteration and anesthesia. I'm quite sure that the court will be extremely vigilant to not to let itself be dragged into the quicksand. Distinguished members of the court, this observation brings to an end my short presentation this morning. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention, Madam President. Might I ask you to call Maître Salonidis to the bar? Thank you.